um, we find it difficult to make our way back toward that communion. Uh, but because we are designed for it, and because God desires it for us, and is working to bring it about, uh, once we be able to, uh, once we begin to cooperate with God in that project, that mutual project, uh, we see good results and good fruits coming from that. And that's uh, really what the uh, Orthodox Christian Church is all about, is helping that to happen in people's lives. That's why we're here. That's why we do what we do. Hello everyone, welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are on site in the beautiful Sioux Falls, South Dakota. We are now gonna be talking about Orthodox Christianity. We have Father Sava joining us on the show. Hi, Father. Hi, Alan. Thank you so Good much. Good to see you again, my friend. Yes. So Thank nice. you for inviting me to your show. It's an honor to have you on. Thank my you. pleasure. Thank you, thank you. And for those that don't know, Father Sava, Lida is a priest at the Transfiguration Greek Orthodox Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. He has been a priest for 16 years, and you can find the links in the bio below to the transfigurationgoc.org as well as the Facebook page. Father Sava, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions to ask our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? I'll uh, give a two-part answer, Alan, to that question, that good question. Um, as an Orthodox Christian, I'm deeply optimistic about the ultimate direction of our world because it is the good creation of our God who loves us and desires that all should make their way back to Him. And uh, I believe that uh, He is well able to accomplish that desire for all who are willing. And so, in the long run, I'm quite optimistic about the direction of the world. In the short run, however, um, I see that the world is in great turmoil, there's a lot of confusion, uh, there's a lot of dysfunction, um, people are set against one another at all levels of society. Uh, those who uh, rule often take advantage of those who are ruled. Uh, those who have uh, money and power often take advantage of those who don't in order to increase their wealth at the expense of the poor. Um, <clears throat> there's good indication that uh, the natural environment is suffering because of our uh, unwise actions in the last hundred years. I don't know about that myself, I'm not a scientist, but uh, I, I look around and see what's happening and um, I, I have questions about that too. And so I think in the short run, I am not optimistic about the future of the world. Our ability to recommune with God, with the divine, that can potentially heal so many of the issues that we have in our world. Absolutely, yes. Um, we Orthodox Christians believe that we are designed by God, our Creator, uh, for communion with God and with each other, uh, which means uh, the deepest possible uh, healthy relationship. Uh, and that because, uh, mainly because of our own pride, but also because of the general brokenness of God's good creation, um, we find it difficult to make our way back toward that communion. Uh, but because we are designed for it, and because God desires it for us, and is working to bring it about, uh, once we be able to, uh, once we begin to cooperate with God in that project, that mutual project, uh, we see good results and good fruits coming from that. And that's uh, really what the uh, Orthodox Christian Church is all about, is helping that to happen in people's lives. That's why we're here. That's why we do what we do. Could it be that the divine creation 
that is our world is meant for this beautiful journey that we go through in realizing that we all come from God and recommuning with that, is that the purpose of this creation? Indeed, indeed. Yes, the Apostle Paul writes that uh, uh, the whole of creation uh, is groaning with longing for the revealing of the children of God, by which uh, it, he means exactly what we're talking about, uh, the renewal of our, uh, our uh, God-designed uh, communion with with our Creator, God the Holy Trinity. Mm. Yes, indeed. So we, we emphatically do believe that. Um, and we see that uh, not only uh, theoretically is that the case, but in actual fact, when we begin to live uh, in the way that the Church teaches for us to live, uh, in humility, in love, uh, in self-denial, uh, in uh, uh, putting others ahead of ourselves, uh, considering ourselves the least of all, uh, then this really starts to pick up some momentum and we see uh, the healing of God's creation beginning with ourselves because human beings are the crown of God's good creation and creation is broken precisely through our brokenness as a result of our brokenness. So when we begin to be healed, then we see parts of the world around us beginning to be healed as well. Uh, it's not uh, an accident, for example, that if you go to an Orthodox Christian monastery, uh, you will usually find the buildings to be surrounded by beautiful plants of various kinds, flowers and trees and so forth, uh, resembling an earthly paradise. Uh, and so that where prayer is active, where people are drawing close to God, that has repercussions in the natural world around us. And when we all have our unique communions with God, there are different healing processes that occur for each of us due to what we've been dealt since we were born. What would we say is a good healing modality, methodology? Mm -hmm. uh, the church uh, in her wisdom offers us a variety of means of being healed of uh, the uh, the corruption, uh, to use a very strong word, the corruption that leads to death and the disintegration of our being. Um, you know, God took on himself our human flesh in order to overcome this corruption and in, in order to destroy death. And in fact, he gave himself over to death. He, the deathless one, the one who cannot die, uh, died as a man in order to destroy death and open to us uh, the possibility of living deathlessly. And so we Orthodox Christians say that death does not truly exist. Yes, we die biologically, but a human being cannot die eternally uh, because God who sustains us in life uh, wills that we should live eternally uh, as he is eternal and that in the end, uh, our souls and bodies will be reunited through the resurrection. Uh, we can't say a lot of that because, about that because we have not experienced it uh, directly, but uh, that we will be reuni reunited with our bodies which will be incorruptible. That is, that they won't be subject uh, to uh, death, decay, disease, and so forth, all the things that afflict us now. Um, now, how do we get from here to there, which is really your question, mm -hmm. I think. Um, the Church invites us, first of all, um, as our Lord Jesus Christ says, if anyone would be my disciple, if anyone wants to walk with me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And so a life of constant repentance, to use uh, a Christian word, uh, that is of constant turning away from the way that leads to death and turning back toward God who is 
the creator and giver of life. That's what repentance really means. Mm. Uh, a life of constant repentance, which means self-denial, a denial of our, uh, our, our desire to exalt ourselves uh, as the devil exalted himself and rebelled against God. So we turn away from that desire and uh, in repentance we humble ourselves and we take up our, our own cross and follow Jesus Christ. Now, what is my cross? That can vary from person to person. But I would say that um, my cross consists of the things in my life that are either sent by God or permitted by God in order to bring me to salvation, to healing and health and mm -hmm. communion with God. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a different thing for each person mm -hmm. because we're broken in different ways, aren't we? Mm -hmm. And so uh, our Lord in his goodness and with his uh, comprehensive knowledge of us, because he knows us better than we know ourselves, uh, sends just what is needed for us. Some of those things are very hard. That's why we call them crosses. Um, but so the challenges are viewed as the crosses. The challenges, even the sufferings, the sufferings. yes, yes. Uh, because um, God sees what we need to, uh, to experience and to endure in order to be uh, fixed, in order to be healed. Mm -hmm. He sees precisely that, and that's what he's always offering to us. And if we're able to receive that uh, with gratitude and humility from God, then it will do the intended work in us. If we rebel against it and complain against it, <laughs> then it will just make us bitter and angry probably and lead to more misery and brokenness and death, you see. So that's what our Lord is inviting us to do when he says, take up your cross. That is, uh, accept these things that are being offered to you for your salvation from my hand. And you use this word re rejection of the self, the self-denial, mm -hmm. and meaning being selfless, being also understanding the illusion of the self, mm -hmm. the unity of everything, mm -hmm. and the perpetual servitude that one can be in towards uh, humanity, towards the, our world, and then that being one of the most, if not the most divine, then calling. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, we could say it this way maybe, uh, that each human heart has a tendency to create idols. Uh, that is false gods, gods that do not exist and have no power to deliver us from anything, but rather deliver us only into slavery, into servitude, to nothingness. And uh, one of those false gods uh, is our ego, um, our tendency to uh, exalt ourselves and to set ourselves up as the criterion of everything uh, that is real, that is good, and uh, to serve ourselves alone and to organize our whole existence around serving our, our own ego. So that is perhaps the first idol that has to go that has to be destroyed. And after that, there are many other idols that, uh, that we manufacture for ourselves. Uh, that's another, another aspect of the, of the um, project of uh, living as an Orthodox Christian, uh, is that we, um, we seek to worship only the Creator, not the creature, not what He has created, including ourselves and beginning with ourselves, you see. Interesting. So, the, God is uncreated. Uncreated, and yes. And we are created yes, creatures. Yes, yes, yes. God is the only uncreated one. Um, God exists eternally as one God in three persons. One eternal being who has revealed himself to us in three persons. Co-equal, co-eternal. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The famous Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity, yes. That's not something that human beings have made up. 
uh, if one was to, to uh, I suppose, to come up with some kind of conception of God, uh, I, I really doubt that he would come up with something uh, like the Holy Trinity. Uh, and I think that is, for me at least, an argument in, in favor of the accuracy and reality of this uh, revelation of God, his self-revelation. He has revealed himself to us as one God in three persons, as an eternal, uncreated communion of three persons. Mm -hmm. The Father, who is the source of the divinity, the eternal being, the Son, who is co-eternal with the Father, who is begotten uh, from the Father eternally, so that there, were no, well, there was never a time, never a when, when he did not exist, mm -hmm. and the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father, uh, and together with the Father and the Son, is eternally worshipped and glorified. Uh, this is how we are taught to speak of God, to name God. And so we can say that the name of the God that Christians worship is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But we are not tritheists, we are monotheists. Mm -hmm. We worship one God, mm -hmm. but who has revealed himself to us in this way and taught us to name him in this way. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It's always in perpetual kindergarten, you know, <laughs> yes, in, in we life all. school, yeah. And, <laughs> and, uh, yes, and we're talking here about about things that uh, are, are at the edge of our possibility to speak of, you understand, you know. Our language fails not far beyond this point. There's nothing really more that we can say about God or know about God in his eternal being than what we've just said, that he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, now, as God reveals himself to us in time, in history, uh, by, through the Incarnation, by the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Son of God, the Eternal Son of God, uh, taking on our flesh from the Holy Virgin Mary and becoming a human being, a real human being, while at the same time being God, we can say a, thing, a lot of things about that, uh, that revelation of God, because our Lord Jesus Christ not only was born into the world as one of us and grew up as we all did, you know, and became a man uh, gradually, but he, uh, he, he endured all the things that we endure, all the, the vicissitudes of life, the changes and chances of life, as an old prayer says, uh, as, we, as we do endure. But he, uh, he, was not, he was not diminished by any of it. Um, in becoming a man, he certainly humbled himself. Um, being God, he humbled himself. And this is the, the great paradox and beauty of the Christian faith, is that God is not someone uh, far away from us who in arbitrary ways exercises power over us um, in ways that we can't understand and that just frustrate us and, uh, and make us angry. No, that's not who God is. God has revealed himself to us in Jesus Christ as a man and, and as a God at the same time and as the God above all who loves us and who gives himself for us even unto death. So that's, that's the center of our Christian faith. That's what it's all about. And this is another reason why then this Jesus Christ is key because then it gives us a greater idea of what our divine reality is. Yes, yes. In Jesus Christ, we learn who God is. If we want to know what God is like, we don't, we don't speculate, we don't philosophize, but we, we look at the books of the Gospels, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and reading those Gospels together with the letters of Apostle Paul and the other writings in the New Testament, we see who Jesus Christ is. We see who God is in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so if we want to know who God is, everything that we need to know about God is revealed in him. In Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ. And what was yes. written about Jesus Christ through the, through the teachings? Ah, well, the Gospels are, uh, are four in number and they 
describe the life of Jesus Christ, uh, telling pretty much the same story, but from different points of view. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's St. Mark uh, wrote the first gospel, it is believed, simply because his is the shortest. Uh, we don't know that his was the first, but much of his gospel is included in the gospels of St. Matthew and St. Luke. Uh, with additional material, for example, uh, all the stories that we hear at Christmas about the conception of Jesus Christ, the birth of Jesus Christ, and so forth. Those are in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Um, my material is not in Mark's Gospel. It's not in John's Gospel. So um, uh, each of them differs in its uh, contents, even though it tells the same story. It's like you know, you have four witnesses to an event, you know, some, okay. something happens and four people are standing at different places and they are eyewitnesses to this event. Do you think they will tell exactly the same story when they're interviewed later? Well, only if they get together in a room and decide on the story. Otherwise, they're going to tell it differently from their different point of view. And also we believe that each of the the writers of the Gospels was writing for a particular early Christian group, a community, mm -hmm. a church, mm -hmm. a local church, and told the story to serve the needs of that, that uh, early Christian community. This and is so where have, the uh, game of telephone begins. This is yes. where, so, so then the, the signal is over time, we're trying to retain as much of that initial lineage as yes. possible yes. because 2,000 years later, it's really, there's a lot of the game of telephones been played for a long time. Yes, so it has. trying it to has. get back to that initial lineage. Yeah, I, I like that uh, metaphor very much because we've all played that game or something similar and we know what happens in a very short time <laughs> is that <laughs> the message becomes distorted yes. almost beyond recognition sometimes yes, yes. in a very short time. Uh, great care was taken by the first Christians that this should not happen. Now, uh, things weren't written down for quite a while uh, after uh, the Lord Jesus Christ walked the earth. Um, it, it's, um, it, it's a fact that the Bible itself, as we have it now, is a collection of books of, of distinct writings. Uh, was not, not really uh, organized until uh, maybe the end of the fourth century, if I recall correctly, uh, uh, and had the uh, official um, uh, approval of the church as a collection of books and letters to be read in the churches. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, uh, these things circulated by word of mouth, first of all, mm -hmm. these stories, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, about the life and teachings and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, among the early Christian communities. Uh, much of the New Testament is letters that were written, for example, by Apostle Paul in his apostolic work, where he traveled a lot throughout the Mediterranean areas and, uh, and, and uh, began Christian communities in those places. And then as he traveled on to the next place, sometimes he would write a letter back to the group of first Christians that he had established in, in, uh, in another place. And, and so these letters, um, and many, many other writings too, for that matter, uh, circulated in the, in the early years of Christianity. And eventually some of them were uh, approved by the leaders of the church, the bishops meeting in council, as being the ones that ought to be read in church. Uh, the others maybe were good for reading, such as a document called the Didache, the Teaching of the Twelve Apostles. It didn't make it into the New Testament, mm -hmm. but it's very good to read. It's full of good wisdom. And, uh, and also a, a document called the Shepherd uh, of Hermas, uh, a man called Hermas. Um, and and uh, writings like this are within the tradition of the church, but not included in the New Testament. That is, they're not uh, read uh, in yes. the services of the church. And that's the distinction of what is Holy Scripture, what is read during the services What's of read the church. Is yes. Holy Scripture is that's what is read in church. Yes. Now, as we aim to then document God revealing himself through Jesus Christ, as we try and document mm -hmm. that, what were some of the key 
things that were documented about God through being revealed through Jesus Christ? Ah, well, um, to answer that, I could simply refer you to the four Gospels so because it's all there. Um, but uh, his conception, his miraculous conception mm. without human seed, mm. without a, a human father. Um, it's the teaching of the church as recorded in the Gospels that he was conceived of the Virgin Mary. She was a, a young woman. Um, she had lived a very sheltered life after being born of aged parents, like many of the people in the Old Testament were, kind of miraculously, well, absolutely miraculously, a born of, of a couple that were beyond the normal time of childbearing. That's not uh, written in, in the Gospel, by the way, uh, that her parents were old and had her in old age. Uh, that's uh, part of the memory of the church that was not written down mm -hmm. in the Gospels. Um, but she, uh, she was born in that way, and then uh, a at a certain time, uh, she was taken in under the protection of an old man called Joseph, who was a kinsman of hers. And they were betrothed simply because in that time, a woman who was uh, uh, growing up needed to be under the protection of a man. And indeed, in the societies uh, in that part of the world today, in the Middle East, it's still the case that each woman uh, lives her life uh, with a man as her point of reference. Um, in the, the Arab societies, for example, that's the way it is. Um, so, uh, she conceived, she bore a son, and he was called Jesus Christ, according to uh, the words of the angel who revealed this to, to her. Mm. That's what's recorded in, in the New Testament. Um, immediately, when the world took notice of this, um, the powers of the world, in the person of the Roman governor of the area, um, uh, tried to find the child and put him to death because he thought that he was a threat to uh, earthly authority. Wow. And indeed he was. Yeah. Um, later on, uh, his own people, the leaders of his own people, would seek to put him to death and in the end they would succeed in handing him over to be crucified by the Roman authorities. Because again, he was a threat perceived by them as a threat to their established authority yes. and way of doing things. And so this began very early on when he was still a baby and it said that he and his mother and his guardian, St. Joseph, had to flee to Egypt, all the way to Egypt, to escape the threat of, of being done to death by the soldiers sent by King Herod. And so his, his, his life was always lived uh, in, in uh, in danger, in danger from the beginning. Um, so he grew up <laughs> and he emerged into the world, into the, into the public eye, we could say, uh, with the event of his baptism by a man called John, who was baptizing people in the Jordan River, mm. uh, offering them baptism as a sign of repentance, of turning back toward God. And uh, St. John was sent by God to prepare his way that is, to prepare the people's hearts uh, for God's appearance in their midst. Mm -hmm. And one day, while John was baptizing people, that is, immersing them in the water of the Jordan, Jesus Christ appeared to be baptized with the other people. Mm -hmm. And John recognized who he was. He, he knew that he was the Messiah, mm -hmm. the promised Savior of Israel, promised through the prophets. And he said, uh, it's not right that I should baptize you. You know, I'm not worthy to do this. Um, but Jesus Christ says, it's okay, you should do this. I want you to do this in order to fulfill all righteousness. That is, uh, to show people the right way to do things. Mm -hmm. uh, and our Lord in all things uh, is an example to us of, of how to do things properly. And so even though he didn't need to be cleansed, he didn't need to be baptized, he didn't need to repent of anything because he was perfectly sinless, uh, nevertheless, he submitted to be baptized. And when he was baptized, it says, the heavens opened and the voice, a voice came forth saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is the voice of God the Father that everyone heard. According to one gospel, everybody heard it. According to another gospel, only he heard it. Mm -hmm. But in any case, the voice came forth. And then the Holy Spirit 
represented in the form of a dove, a bird, mm. came down and alighted upon him. Mm. Now, the Father is not a voice, the Father is not a sound, the Holy Spirit is not a bird. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Neither the Father nor the Holy Spirit became incarnate, mm -hmm. uh, that is, joined themselves to our created mm. world. Um, but on that occasion, uh, their presence was testified to by this voice and by this bird. And what did the voice say? This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And so, in this way, God revealed himself right off the bat when our Lord Jesus Christ was baptized. After that, he went around doing good. He preached to the people good news that the kingdom of God was very near. That is, God isn't far away. He hasn't forgotten you. Mm. He's not angry with you. He loves you, in fact. And, and uh, as a demonstration of that love, Jesus Christ healed people of physical diseases. He healed them of spiritual diseases uh, in the form of being possessed by demons sometimes. He cast the demons out. They had no, no defense against him because he, he is their creator and he has authority over them. And so he freed people from physical illness, from spiritual illness. He also spoke to those in authority who were abusing their authority, weren't serving the people in love as God had appointed them to do. People like the priests of the time, of the Jewish people, the, the people uh, called the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. These were groups of people who were in positions of honor and authority over the people, but they weren't doing their job properly at that time. And so our Lord Jesus Christ rebuked them and called them to repentance, especially. And um, he preached uh, good news to the poor, as it says, liberation to the captives. And uh, for everyone, he had a word of salvation to speak. Um, and he would say the word that each person needed to hear um, in order to uh, begin their journey back to God. Often his teaching was in the form of stories that we call parables. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most famous is the parable of the prodigal son. Um, a younger brother of two brothers who lived in his father's house but decided that he didn't want to live there anymore. And he asked his father to divide what would be his inheritance between him and his brother so that he could have it now. He was really, in essence, asking his father to, to act as though he were already dead <laughs> and to give him the money that would come to him in that case. The father very humbly did so, even knowing what kind of disaster was likely to follow. And indeed, the, the young, younger brother, uh, the son, goes into a foreign land where nobody knows him and he spends all of the money on riotous living, it says, and um, we can imagine what, uh, what he did with it. He went through it very quickly and he finds himself destitute and, and gets a job from one of the local people feeding pigs, which is about the worst thing that can happen to a Jew, you know, because pigs and Jews don't mix. Uh, they, don't, uh, they don't associate with pigs, much less eat them. So there he is in the pigsty, covered in mud, He's hungry, he's tired, he's cold, he's lonely. Uh, well, what has happened? Really, the, he represents our human nature that has turned away from God and wandered to a distant land, a faraway land, and has uh, spent its life on vanity, on nothing, mm -hmm. basically, mm -hmm. you know, and finds itself destitute, naked, hungry, cold, lonely. And not only that, but in bondage to the demons, you know, represented by the pigs. But a miracle happens then. In the story, the young man says, why am I here? He comes to himself, it says. He returns to himself. Mm. He says, why am I here? Even the servants in my father's house have enough to eat. You know, they have everything they need. Why am I here? 
I don't have to be here. I can swallow my pride, I can stand up, and I can start the long journey back to my father's house. And he makes a little plan. He says, when I get there, I'm going to say to my father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, I'm not worthy anymore to be called your son. Please make me as one of your hired servants. And this is his plan. And he's, as he goes on the road toward his father's house, he rehearses this little speech that he wants to make. But he never gets to make it. Because as soon as his father catches sight of his son returning, and we get the sense that he's been watching for him ever since he left, the father runs out to greet him, and he embraces him, and the son starts to make the speech, Father, I have sinned before heaven and before earth. I'm not worthy to be called your son. The father is immediately calling his servants to bring fine clothing for the boy, a ring for him, you know, shoes for his feet, clean him up, um, prepare a banquet, because my son was lost and now he's found. He was dead, now he's alive. And so he, he, he makes this marvelous feast. There's another part of the story about the older brother, the son who stayed at home, and, his, and his response to, <laughs> to this event of the return of the younger brother, do you suppose he's happy to see his brother? <laughs> no, Where? not at all, not at all. He's sulking there? outside the house while he hears all the party going on. And he asks one of the servants, well, what's going on? He said, well, your brother's come back and your dad is throwing a party. And he goes into the father, or the father comes out to him, excuse me, just as he came out to the younger son. Uh, if I remember correctly, the father comes out and says, uh, What's the matter, my son? And he complains, this son of yours who wasted all your money on harlots and so forth. And now he comes back and you give him this big party where I've always been here with you, serving you faithfully, and you never gave me even a goat so I could have a party with my friends. You know? <laughs> he's bitter and he's angry. And he's, he's just, uh, he's so angry he can't even call this man his brother anymore. This son of yours, he says who has wasted all your living. Mm -hmm. And what does the father say to him? To show his love, which is as great for that son as it is for the other one. Mm -hmm. He says, my son, you're always with me. All that I have is yours. Was it not right that when your brother came back, we should, we, we should rejoice, because he was dead. He's, re he's resurrected from the dead, you know, practically speaking. So that's how the story ends. And I hope I've told it accurately. But you get the gist. Um, it's it's uh, beautiful and simple and yet immensely powerful. We can all relate to it, you know, just oh, on yeah. the literal level and also, you know, in the broader way uh, of, of uh, seeing how it describes our, our uh, corrupted human nature and, and its restoration in Christ. So uh, this is how our Lord taught the people. <laughs> Wow, the yeah. amount of story that exists that has so many profound learning lessons embedded in them is just gorgeous. And to be able to go back and to, and to take these stories and to find deep meaning in them in driving our own ethical and moral and spiritual evolution ourselves because hearing things like that make us reflect on our own behavior and and seek out a more righteous way of of living mm -hmm. and also coming like you like you're describing as well this this god revealing himself through jesus christ and then our uh documenting of the way that jesus christ is is healing and is bringing this light th to onto others and then having others be able to commune back and go through that process of, of, of realizing divinity. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's explore the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? We, um, <clears throat> speak of our Lord the Holy Spirit 
as the third person of the Holy Trinity, along with the Father and the Son, co-eternal, co-equal, uncreated, um, who uh, in, the, in the creed, which is this great statement of faith that was composed by the church uh, by the fourth century, it was completed. Um, the, uh, the creed speaks of the Holy Spirit as the Lord, the giver of life who spoke by the prophets. So the Holy Spirit speaks through the prophets of the Hebrew times, um, the Old Testament times, mm. uh, in order to um, correct the people and to uh, recalibrate them, we could say, from time to time. And they, they always needed recalibrating, as all of us do, <laughs> because we, we get kind of wonky. You know, we go astray and we need to be recalibrated. That is the work of our Lord, the Holy Spirit. And also to uh, proclaim through the prophets the coming of God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. That is his, his job too. Now after the incarnation, uh, in the time now of the church, uh, the Holy Spirit empowers, first of all, the apostles to go out into all the world and proclaim the death of death in Jesus Christ, to proclaim the possibility of the restoration of human nature from its corruption and, and the death of death so that we have the possibility of eternal life with God. Um, now these apostles, with the exception of St. Paul, were not educated men. Um, several of them were fishermen. No, they were just ordinary, humble people. How did they uh, receive the gifts that they needed to go out and do this mighty work, to go out to, to distant lands and uh, where places where they did not even know the local language and, and speak to the people about these things in such a way that they received the word? Uh, it was by the power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, his, his job simply is to continue to bear witness to God's revelation of himself in Jesus Christ. Interesting. Yeah, that's, that's who the Holy Spirit is. Okay. And we don't say a lot more about him than that because he hasn't become incarnate, just as the Father hasn't become incarnate. And so in the beautiful icon or holy picture uh, of the three angels drawn by Saint Andrei Rublyov, uh, in medieval times, which is the great, uh, one of the great treasures of Russia, uh, we see three angels and allegorically they represent the three persons of the Holy Trinity. We don't say they are the Holy Trinity because the Father and the Holy Spirit can't be depicted because they've never taken on flesh. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the Son, the central angelic figure, mm -hmm. Is, um, is very solid looking, very opaque uh, in the way that St. Andrei Rublyov has drawn him, painted him. Uh, whereas the other two figures that may correspond, we may say to the Father and to the Holy Spirit, are more ethereal, more translucent almost, to indicate that they, they never were incarnate. Uh, and so that's kind of a way of indicating through uh, the means of, of uh, a painting, uh, the truth of, of who God is. So this leads us to then asking one of, I think, the most important questions here, which is that how do we have this religious pluralism all coexist? Mm -hmm. That we have this idea of a god or source and that all of us have our own unique relationship with recommuning with that mm -hmm. and there's all different religions there's even science that says this comes from a big bang 13.8 billion years ago how do you see these things mm -hmm. coexisting sure that's uh, that's the big question one of the big questions of our time isn't it um, when uh, the world is, um, the world's population is being stirred up, so to speak, and uh, uh, because of the, the great mobility that we have had in the last century and a half, let's say, that 
uh, really did not exist before that, at least not in the, uh, uh, to the degree that we have it now. Uh, peoples are moving about and encountering one another and having to live side by side mm -hmm. in ways that they never did before. Yes. And so it, uh, it, it represents an immense opportunity for all of us to be enriched by uh, the wisdom of one another. Yeah. Um, but I'm afraid that more often uh, what happens is that we, um, we, we enter into conflict with each other because of different uh, cultural assumptions, different beliefs, uh, different allegiances. Um, so for example, um, one of the great forces in the world today, uh, alongside Christianity, is Islam, which is a very different uh, uh, way of understanding God, the world, human nature, human destiny, uh, from, from the uh, Christian way of understanding these things. It's a different revelation, um, a revelation of a very different character which creates a culture of a very different character from Christian culture. Um, it may be that these two cultures are irreconcilable I personally believe that um, Christian culture and Muslim culture have a lot to say to each other. Uh, and in fact, they have lived side by side in many places in the world for centuries. Um, however, uh, it is a fact that wherever uh, the Muslim culture is the dominant culture, uh, Christians are placed uh, in a lower level. They have great uh, social disabilities placed on them. Uh, millions of them have been martyred uh, in the Muslim, Muslim lands um, uh, from the time of uh, the conquest after Muhammad until t today it's still going on. And uh, we, we dare not uh, uh, brush this under the rug or pretend that all is uh, sweetness and light yes. because it's not. Uh, the yes. borders between Christianity and Islam are always almost always bloody. Um, however, Christians and Muslims have succeeded in living together in peace in various places where they have a rough parity of population sizes and um, uh, they found ways to live, live together in peace. Um, but usually not by living next door to one another, <laughs> you know, in the same town. Usually by having villages that are Christians, ones that are Muslim, you know, and so forth, or sections of a city where the, the different uh, homogenous populations will settle. Uh, here in America, it's very different because anybody can buy a house next to anybody else, you know. It's, it's very easy for a Christian to buy a house next to a Muslim and vice versa, and so we must find a way to live together here. Um, I think that is a, a project that's worthy of our greatest effort and greatest attention. That same analogy must be also seen at that global level, similarly of like, uh, we need to learn how to live together on this planet. Absolutely, yeah. we do, we do. I'm not optimistic uh, of our chances for doing that because um, I think, uh, if we speak developmentally about um, human nature, uh, we are designed to live in tribes, for want of a better word, you know. That's how we function best, among people who are like ourselves, who share our worldview, our values, uh, our religious traditions, and so forth. That's how we function most effectively, it seems to me anyway. I'm just offering my own opinion here. Um, and so I think we have great difficulties in the modern world because we are not, we could say, designed or we're not adapted, we could say maybe, to, to uh, function alongside, to live alongside people with very, who have very different assumptions about reality than we do. We're just not adapted for that, it seems to me. And so that's why we have such difficulty, I think. It's not that it's impossible. We can do it. And I think as Christians, we are obliged to try yes. uh, to humble ourselves yes. but, uh, and to live 
with others in peace as much as we can. But at the same time, we're not obliged to allow people who do not value what we value and are not interested in living in peace with us to invade and our land and supplant us. We're not obliged to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's finding the way between those two uh, that I think is important for us in, in the world as it is. You bring up, um, you know, uh, Christianity and Islam, which have this history that you that you've described. Very difficult history. Yes. What about Taoism and Buddhism and Hinduism and these mm -hmm. others that uh, have also had issues, of always, mm -hmm. um, but also that seem to have these deep roots in just the most meditative, mm -hmm. flow-driven mm -hmm. being. Yes. Well. Uh, as, as an Orthodox Christian, I would say that God has revealed himself in many and various ways, as it says in the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. He has revealed himself in many and various ways throughout human history. That's really and including in that, uh, and, 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 and in Hebrews it, it speaks specifically of his revelation of himself uh, through the prophets of Israel. But I, I believe that uh, we can extend that revelation to include all of the ancient philosophical and religious traditions of mankind. Um, not that any of them is complete, yes. but that each of us, each of them, in each of them, we can perhaps recognize foreshadowings of God's complete revelation of himself in Jesus Christ. Um, there are many things in uh, in those traditions that uh, we would not uh, recognize or accept as Orthodox Christians. For example, the, uh, the egregious polytheism that exists in Hinduism, you know, mm -hmm. where various attributes of divinity are, uh, I guess we could say reified or, or identified uh, with a particular supposed deity, you know, so you have this proliferation of thousands of uh, of supposed deities, and uh, that's a mistake, we think. Uh, that's not accurate to reality. Um, but at the same time, you know, the, uh, 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 for example, the, uh, uh, the life cycle, and it's been a long time since I studied these things, but uh, the idea of there being seasons in a human's life. You know, mm. there's the season when you're young and you're learning yeah. to be a human being. There's the season when you're a householder and you're preoccupied with uh, marital life maybe and raising children. Yes. Uh, there's a season when you are a, a worker primarily. And, and there's a season then in old age where you're preparing yourself for death, for your departure from this mm. world. And I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the specifics of the terminology. I studied these things as an undergraduate a <laughs> lifetime ago, but, but you understand what I'm talking about. I think that, that's a very profound and helpful way of speaking about, about human life, because we do change as we grow older and we experience different um, identities, almost, you could say, mm -hmm. uh, as we make our way through our life in this world. And that idea that at the end, we should consciously withdraw from active life and devote ourselves to the preparation for what comes next. And we might, as Christians, speak differently about what comes next than Hindus would, for example, or Buddhists or Taoists or whatever. But, but that, that idea of that schema of human life, I think, is, is something that resonates with me very strongly because I'm about to, uh, uh, I hope, uh, retire from active human life in a few years and devote myself to getting ready for what comes next. May God grant it. Um, I loved how you described God revealing himself through so such a beautiful variety of um, potentials and how then it's in the uh, essences and eyes and ex feelings of the seekers that are seeking that communion with God revealing himself mm -hmm. that then are able to identify all these different potential modalities. I want to also um, express how and hear how you feel about this that then some of the seekers are attempting to then commune with God expressing himself through science, through mathematics. Mm -hmm. And 
attempting to do so by understanding the 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 at the most granular level how the even subatomic particles work how uh, the inner workings of our biological me mechanisms work mm -hmm. and so these are kind of like the absolute like diver deepers into all the mm -hmm. mechanics and trying to understand the source code of creation yes. Yes. so in a sense that's also communing with god revealing himself through math and through science mm -hmm. and so w w that's another one of those coexist can that coexist could that potentially help bridge together all of the religious pl pluralism with with science could science and spirituality marry together and then how do you feel about all that well that's that's a lot to try to get my arms around <laughs> it's a big question alan but um i'll give it a shot you know i think it was uh blaise pascal the the uh the, the uh, renaissance uh, philosopher and and, uh, and christian believer faithful christian uh, who said that uh, scientific investigation is, is thinking God's thoughts after him, if I'm remembering correctly. Mm, mm. And I've always, I've always kind of liked that phrase, thinking God's thoughts after him, mm. because um, God uh, being the creator of all, as we Christians believe him to be, um, uh, he's described in the scriptures, in the Gospel of St. John, with the word logos, the mm. word which means word, mm. or reason, or speech. Um, this Greek word logos is often left untranslated, and of course it's uh, the word that's the review, uh, that's at the root of, of many of our words, um, theology, the logos of God. Uh, uh, psychology, the, the logos of the human soul, uh, the, 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 the reason or the teaching or the, the inner, inner workings of, uh, the created reality of. Uh, so God is logos, God is the one who speaks things into existence. Um, God said, let there be light and there was light. It says famously in the first chapter of the Bible in Genesis. So. Um, I think that these things naturally, it's natural to, to try to uh, consider these things together. However, I would say that um, the things being revealed by scientific investigation uh, are becoming so numerous that it's impossible for one person to know them <laughs> to begin with, only a very small part of them. Uh, you know, God's creation is so vast and so yeah. at both at the macro and micro level yeah. that it's, it's impossible for the finite human mind to grasp it, um, which I think is evidence uh, uh, for God's uh, being, uh, myself. Um, I think uh, the best scientist is the one who is the most humble intellectually, uh, who always thinks of his or her work as being provisional mm. and being susceptible to be replaced by something else that is discovered or a better understanding and uh, always to need to be tested by empirical verification if it's possible. So um, in, in all these ways I see that, you know, uh, the uh, pursuit of science which means knowledge. Uh, it comes from the Latin word, which simply means knowledge tr of tr the truth, mm -hmm. the true nature of things. Um, if it's done honestly and humbly, according to the scientific method itself, yes. um, it is in no way opposed to uh, uh, our, uh, um, our, our uh, view of how the world is or how God is. Uh, Truth is one, uh, I like to say. Yeah. Truth is one, as God is one. And uh, any honest pursuit of truth um, will lead to the same place, to the same truth. 
Um, that's how I see these things. I'm not sure I answered your question, yes, but uh, definitely. This is this is how I think about these things. But I don't know anything about them really. I, I just I'm just one person who looks at the world and and tries to make sense of things like everybody else question along the way on that subject would be then how about then the story of um, of orthodox christianity in terms of god's creation versus what science says about the evolution of humanity from our ancestors from mm -hmm. s from the big bang to the sure, to the atoms sure. and the plants and stars and then from single cell mm -hmm. to multi cell organisms yes, etc yes, um, yes yes I'm going from a, a kind of an undifferentiated very simple uh, but highly energetic uh, reality to uh, a much more dif ver differentiated and complex and um, uh, environment in which the energy is more dispersed than it was at the beginning um, which, if I understand correctly, is kind of how scientists now are looking at things. Yeah. Uh, I don't know a lot about that, but I read a little bit. Um, it seems to me that that is not uh, uh, in any way um, uh, at odds with uh, what we believe as Orthodox Christians about uh, God's creation of the world from the beginning until now. And incidentally, when we speak of creation, we don't just mean of God's creating the initial conditions or the initial stuff, mm -hmm. but it, we mean a continuing process uh, by which God's uncreated energy keeps, uh, maintains the world in, in, in existence, mm -hmm. keeps it going from moment to moment. If it didn't, everything would fall apart. We know the tendency in, in uh, the physical world is toward, not toward increased complexity and differentiation, but when the energy is drawn out of it, it, it collapses into dust, entropy, you know, mm -hmm. if I understand things correctly. And so it seems to me that in order for the world to be maintained in being, uh, this creative energy, uncreated energy, uh, uncreated creative energy, <laughs> if we can say so, um, or God's preserving energy, we could, we could term it maybe, um, must continually be uh, injected into the world. The world has to be suffused with this energy, otherwise it would collapse back into nine being. Um, that's my understanding of things. There are other Orthodox Christians who, who would uh, uh, take issue with what I just said, probably, which doesn't bother me at all. The church has no uh, official teaching on these things. We say that uh, we believe in one God who created the heavens and the earth. And that's, that's all that we're obliged to believe formally about these things. Uh, the church doesn't teach us how old the world is, for example, mm -hmm. when it began. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it teaches that the world began uh, by God's will, and by his action, the God that the, this world will, as it is now, will come to an end at some point, known only to God. And uh, we live in between those times as best we can. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. And maybe even one of the recent beautiful ways of seeing what God potentially is that I've really enjoyed is that we, as we evolve towards complexity, that we then have the ability to then take the initial substrate that created creation and then embed that in our complexity to cycle another creation. And then that is just a cyclical process of yes. God. Yes, we were talking about that the other day, weren't we? Yeah. yeah um, as Christians, we understand uh, history pretty much linearly, as I mentioned a minute ago, you know, from its beginning to its end point. And then um, all of it, though, um, contained, if we can put it this way, within the realm of eternity, which is not like uh, our existence now. You know, we live historically now. Yesterday, today, tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow, we don't know. <laughs> All we have, uh, the only time we have uh, really is now, now, this moment when we're talking with each other. We don't know whether there'll be a next moment or not. 
Um, and so that's how, um, how Christians generally think of or understand uh, reality. However, within that linear span of history and within that eternal now of eternity, can there be recurring cycles? And I would say certainly. Uh, if we read the, the books of the Old Testament, the history of old Israel, for example, we see uh, cycles of um, flourishing of return to God and faith in God and trust in God and um, uh, a, a reaping of the benefits of all that in the daily lives of the people. And then we see uh, that degenerating into times of apostasy, of fleeing from God, uh, fleeing toward uh, idols created by men's hands and so forth, and the slavery that the people uh, experience as the result of that, not freedom, but slavery. And then they need to repent of that and return to God. God sends prophets to remind them of who they are, who God is. They repent sometimes, return to God. So there is that cyclical uh, action going on, you could say. Mm -hmm. I think in each of our lives too. You know, we, we uh, often say in orthodoxy that the Christian life is one of continuous repentance not just initial repentance when we turn back. Mm -hmm. But you know, when the prodigal son has returned to his father's house, he needs to be watchful over himself yes. and make sure when he needs to repent again in small things that he does so that he's not tempted to do another big rebellion <laughs> and uh, find himself, you know, in the midst of swine, hungry and cold and naked and so yes. forth. So. It was just a few thoughts in response to your good question. Yes, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. What about the creation having both good and evil, mm -hmm. and then the interplay of those two yes. within our lives? Yes, that's a question that has preoccupied human beings always, I mm -hmm. think. Good and evil, the mystery of good and evil. Um, As God has revealed himself to us, uh, we Orthodox Christians believe that God is good and that God doesn't change. Uh, that means that if God was good in the beginning, God is still good. We can rely on God being good tomorrow and of God being favorably uh, disposed toward us. He's for us, he's on our side, we can say. Um, God does not change. Uh, in, in our work of salvation, it's not our job to change God's mind. That doesn't mean to happen because God is always for us. And I say this because this distinguishes us as Eastern Orthodox Christians from some varieties of Western Christianity where the, pro, uh, the, the project seems to be uh, precisely to change God's mind. Um, either by doing good works that he'll see and then he'll be favorably disposed toward us, uh, or by interposing Jesus Christ between us and God the Father who is angry with us and wants to get us uh, so that he will see his son and uh, the goodness and beauty of his son and then change his mind about us. This seems to be the project of certain kinds of Western Christianity, but um, we don't see that in, in orthodoxy at all. If we, if, if we in the Bible uh, or in some of the prayers and hymns of the church, we talk about God being angry with us. It's metaphorical. It's to remind us uh, that this is serious business, you know, that uh, though God is for us, we must be willing for God to do his good work of healing and recreation within our, within our lives. Uh, if we're not willing, God being very humble and gentle will not run over us and force us. Because if you force someone, it's not love. It's no longer love. It's coercion or, mm. or um, oppression, mm -hmm. you see. Um, so um, we, uh, uh, we understand that God is, is always for us. He's always making himself available to us very humbly, but we must open the door. We must invite him in, you know, to do his good work in us. Where does evil come from then? 
Um, God does not create evil. Interesting. That's the, clearly the teaching of the, the Christian church of the East and the West. God does not create evil. We create it through our ignorance? We create it through our ignorance and through our rebellion, our, our fruitless rebellion against, against reality, really. Um, against God who only wills good things for us. Um, yes, in those ways we create it for ourselves. Um, and it makes for a good story that we created it for ourselves. It, it, well, it's yeah, a challenge, yeah. more challenging. It's, yes, yes. Uh, there, are, there are such stories in the Bible, beginning with the story of our first created man and woman, our first parents, Adam and Eve, which is a powerful story if we understand that it is the story not just of the first humans, but of every one of us. You know, it's the story of our, um, of our willful ignorance in the face of God's gift of himself to us. Our willful ignorance through which we, um, we make an idol that we prefer to God, to the reality of God, and to the reality of what he has created us to be. So, um, and that, uh, of course, that pattern is, is repeated again and again throughout history. It's documented in the scriptures. It's documented in history. It's documented, you know, by our own consciousness of how we, how we are, each of us. If we come to, to the knowledge of that, then uh, we're not living in obliviousness, you know, we'll come to the knowledge yeah. of that and, uh, and we'll wake up and we'll say, will come to ourselves and will say, yes. I will arise and go to my father's house. Yeah, yeah, how gorgeous it is that we all get to experience life and yeah. consciousness and all of these beautiful oh. gifts of family and friends and food, mm -hmm. water, air, mm -hmm. all these types of things. And all just, these things are good, very good, God gorgeous. says, as yeah. he creates everything. You wake and up to how beautiful it is. Yes. And yeah, yes. Divine, divinely commune back with me. Would, um, what role then at all these bifurcating moments of choice that we have of of pursuing a certain thing or pursuing another one these potential choices not always binary and good and evil but um they're altering moments in our life trajectory what role does free will play in those choices mm -hmm. and where does determinism fall into mm -hmm. the picture mm -hmm. yes well we understand as orthodox christians that we each have a choice. Um, sometimes it's very difficult for us to choose uh, God, to choose the way that leads back to God. It's not easy for the prodigal son to get up from the mud in the midst of the pigs and say, I will arise and go to my father's house. It's not easy. Um, and sometimes it's a lot harder than others in the case of someone who is enslaved, for example, to some kind of addiction. It's very hard, very hard to break out of that slavery. God will help, but we have to really want it. We have to really want it, and we have to make our own feeble effort to and enlist the help of others whom God sends to us. Um, but it is always possible for us to choose the good, um, to know the good and to choose the good. Um, someone asked me just yesterday, what about in the case of a person who is a psychopath? Is there a possibility of repentance and redemption for such a person? In other words, could such a person be healed mm -hmm. by having that part of the personality that is missing or is corrupted to be restored? I said, theoretically, yes, but how often does it happen? <laughs> you know, possibly yes. We we have to we have to believe that everyone is uh, has the possibility of being restored, having the image of God in which he has created or she has created to be restored and perfected uh, to its original beauty. But sometimes it's very hard to see how that happens, at least in human terms. Uh, but with God, everything is possible. Yeah, yeah. Often uh, in Orthodoxy we speak of the, the life of a human being in Christ as um, being 
cleaned or, or um, cleansed of the things that don't belong, purified the things that don't belong on us and in us, in our lives. Uh, just as maybe uh, a picture, an icon that has hung in a church for centuries, maybe somewhere in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, has been there for five centuries, let's say, uh, uh, a holy picture. It's not the way the artist painted it. Well, it is, but it's all covered with soot from candles and lamps and incense and all, and just dust for centuries and centuries. And so you can hardly see what's there, what the painter put there. Mm -hmm. So what needs to happen to that picture? Does it need to be taken out and chopped up and burned? No. No, it needs to be purified. It yes. needs to be cleansed so it can shine with its original beauty that its maker intended. And that's a, a perfect uh, analogy, I think, for us. It is exactly what has that. to happen yes. for us, uh, yes. that we must allow our Lord, the Holy Spirit, to do his good work in us, which is sometimes very painful. The process of the restoration of a picture is fraught with many dangers, <laughs> you know, to, use, uh, to push the analogy maybe a little further. It might hurt us to be to be cleansed because some of these things have become so much a part of us uh, that, that we come to believe this is who we are. You know, we identify ourselves as that which we are not, you know, that which doesn't belong in us. And so it can be very painful to have those things generally being removed. But that's what must happen if we are to shine with our original beauty, just like uh, the, the uh, restoration of a, a beautiful painting yeah. takes place with great care and gentleness and uh, uh, an attempt not to damage anything of the original that yes. remains. Yes. And when it's finished, I saw a video on YouTube just the other day, so I'm thinking about that, mm -hmm. a Renaissance painting that was, yeah. was restored in just that way at right. the end. The various uh, places where the image had just disappeared, it had flaked off after they got done cleaning the whole thing and gluing it all together again, uh, the restorer took a fine brush and, and some paints and just gently painted in those parts again, very, very respectfully and not in any kind of ostentatious way, but with the idea to reproduce the original, yeah. recreate the original, uh, so everything would, would function harmoniously again. It was, it was a miracle to miracle. see, really. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the miracle that can happen for us too. Yes. I really love the analogy of the painting that is very, very, very well uh, dusted off and, and cleansed. Although that, that process may, it's a clearing our channel to anchor the divine. There may be some, some triggers or traumas in that process that we can integrate and we can repair those in order for us to heal and not repeat. And, as we do that process, it's also a good analogy. It's like a gem. Very similarly with the gem, we're, 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 we're cleaning the gem. We're making the gem able to shine. And the gem is like us individually being able to bring our gifts forth into the world and have the sunlight shine through the gem and break apart into a prism and just shine on the planet with our unique gifts. Yes. And so... I love that that analogy, and it, and it does not come without hard, sincere self work and connection yes, to the divine. In certainly, that and always with God's help. Yes, Jesus Christ says, "I am the light of the world. He who believes in me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life." He also says to us, "You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hid." And so um, we can think of the analogy perhaps of the sun, the Lord Jesus Christ being the sun, the source of light and life and warmth and all good things, and we being like the moon who reflect that light uh, to the degree that we have been purified and illumined by his, by his light, by his, his grace, his, his power to, to illumine and to save. That's gorgeous. That's gorgeous. And then there may even be, we could say that the more that we've been 
purified our channel that the more we are like the full moon that can then reflect so much of that sunlight onto earth and the, mm -hmm. maybe the the more we have oil within the water that the more it's like the new moon where there's less light being able to be reflected what is it like um running the church there's a process of going to seminary school there's a process of becoming a deacon then becoming a priest and then for those that would like to becoming a bishop which oversees um, regional uh, uh, churches and priests and um, deacons act as uh, helpers um, so how how does this all work and then there's you know communities in the areas come that are um, christian that come to the churches to do the practice and you engage with dozens if not even up to hundreds of people and act as um as a, a as 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 someone that's trained in the divine to help them with their communions this is a beautiful thing and it's also complex and i'd love for you to talk about it i'll try mm -hmm. i'll try um it is a beautiful thing and i'm uh, thankful constantly to god for um, permitting me the privilege to be um his representative, so to speak, to his people, um, and also uh, the intercessor for the people before uh, God's throne, uh, because that's the main work of the priest, is to pray for the people. Uh, also to, um, uh, to offer sacrifices to God for the people, as we say, which simply means to serve the services of the church um, in such a way that uh, uh, the, the things of this world, the things of God's good creation are offered up to him and transfigured by him and returned to us as, um, as life-giving realities. Um, the, the premier example, of course, is the divine liturgy, which in the West is called the Mass. Uh, it's the service of uh, of, uh, it's, it's the premier service of the church, the central action of the people of God, by which we bring ourselves, first of all, together into the temple of God, offering ourselves to him, for him to purify us and illumine us and uh, draw us, draw us uh, increasingly closer to him and then send us out into the world to be his witnesses, his hands, so to speak. Um, we do this in an interesting way. Um, this all happens in a very interesting way, which was given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ on the night uh, before he was given over to death. Um, he uh, very simply called his friends together, his 12 disciples, and he took a bit of bread and he said to them, he gave thanks and he broke it and said to them, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this, istinamin uh, anamnesin, it says in Greek, to, uh, for the uh, recollection of me. Um, and then the same thing with the cup of wine. He took the cup and blessed, gave thanks and gave it to them saying, this is the cup of my blood which is shed for the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins to this for the remembrance of me um, th with this command he inaugurated the the service of the holy liturgy in which we do the same thing imitating him we take bread a little bread ordinary bread that we've made for this purpose a cup some wine in it and we uh, we bless it we pray over it we ask our lord the holy spirit to sanctify it and to change it into our Lord's body and blood according to his promise, which becomes our spiritual food and drink. Um, we receive in, in, in a physical way uh, the deathless body and blood of Jesus Christ, who has himself destroyed death by his death and risen and can never die again. We receive that deathlessness into ourselves in this way every time we receive Holy Communion. It's a very powerful thing. It is as tangible and tasteable <laughs> as, as anything could be. 
this communion we have with our God who has um, for us uh, uh, provided himself to us in this way, physically, not just spiritually in some kind of ethereal way, but very, very tangibly and tasteably in Holy Communion so that we become one with him physically and also, of course, uh, in every other way. Um, but um, so this is, this is the work of the priest, is to sanctify these, the people through these means that God has made available to us, uh, through prayer, through sacrifice, through the holy mysteries or sacraments, as we say, um, holy baptism, holy communion, and the other sacraments, all of which use some kind of tangible, created physical reality um, as the means by which God communicates himself to us. Um, it's very beautiful uh, and, uh, and powerful, and you see uh, that God's energies are imparted to people and their lives change mm -hmm. as a result. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's a great privilege for a, a, a priest to have a front row seat to all of these things, yeah. you can say. Uh, and despite our own unworthiness and inadequacy, all these things happen according to God's word and promise through his energy, not our own. So um, it's, it's a beautiful thing to be a part of, and I'm very thankful for it. Mm. Was there anything else in your question that I neglected no. to hit on nope. or touch on? Nope, excellent. Okay. Good, good. And how about as we progress into this exponential technology age, there's eight billion humans on the planet, the geopolitics, like you were describing, people are able to fly to different places and move and live next to people that they would have potentially never had the chance to live next to before. The power of the technologies being democratized and put in our hands at, at unprecedented rates. So how do you see the, what would be maybe like a main principle that we could embody both as children and as adults that could help us really get through the complexity of the next couple decades? Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I, I don't want to assume that this represents progress from one level of being to a, another level of being, a higher or better level of being. Mm. It may very well uh, represent some kind of regression for human beings. That the exponential technology era yes. could. Yes. That's I, a very interesting point. I think we, we need point. to bear in mind that possibility because yes. to my way of thinking, it's, it's equally possible or maybe even more possible that it is in fact a, re a regression uh, than any kind of uh, progression. The fact that we have yet to fully unleash and unlock the potential of our own biological communion with yes. the divine, and yes. yet we're already going into the technological appendages of yes. the genetic engineering and the neural mm -hmm. implants and yes, the, yes. yeah, this and and we we run a real risk of being enslaved by these things we that we have created yes. uh, by the works of our own hands. It's a matter of idolatry again. In many cases, I believe. I know, for example. Uh, quite a few young men who are addicted to video games, yes. and I don't use that word lightly, they cannot break away from them. Yes. And it's not like these are some kind of a profound means of communion with their own souls or with God. No, they're, they're, um, they're meaningless, really. They're insipid. And yet these young, it's almost always young men, uh, cannot break away from them. This is a real problem, and just an, a, one example among many, many. I mean, look how we are with our cell phones. Mm -hmm. Look how we are. Yeah. I mean, we make jokes about it and draw cartoons about it, but really, it's very serious. It's very serious. We are conducting an experiment on the whole, whole human race yeah. that's unprecedented, and we have no idea the consequences of it. Um, so that's one thing I would want to say. Uh, in a kind of a prophetic mode. I would not assume that this is progress yes. necessarily. Yeah. Um, uh, another thing I would like to say though, perhaps more gently and optimistically, is uh, <laughs> that um, human beings remain human beings. Uh, we are the good creation of God. We are created according to the image of God and his likeness and in his likeness. 
Uh, we were made to resemble God, and we know what God is like in Jesus Christ. We're made to be like that. So if these very powerful tools that we create um, are able in some ways to help us toward that, yes. uh, then thank God, let yes. us use them. Yes. Um, I think that should be our criterion, however, mm. not to uh, make some new technology just because we can. I think there are things that we can do that we ought not to do because they may very well end up be, being uh, dehumanizing. Mm. They may enslave us. So, I don't know much about these things, but um, that's what I think since you asked. The principle of making technology that assists us with the communion with the divine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does the spirit come from God and meets the body for this experience of life? How does that process work? Does, does, does our life and consciousness just emerge from biological evolution? Mm -hmm. um, do we have a spirit or soul that sets into the body? Yes, certainly we do. Um, human beings are unique in all of creation. I, I, I would maintain as an Orthodox Christian and as a priest, uh, we are not like the other animals, even though we are. You know, we're very much like the other animals. We can be described, uh, for example, as the greatest of the great apes. Mm -hmm. you know, that's not an inaccurate description of a human being but it is an in a, a woefully inadequate description of a human being mm -hmm. because it doesn't, um, it doesn't speak at all to the aspect of humanity which is um, foremost, which is that we are uh, created in the image of our creator. No other animal is. Mm. And so while we are animals, obviously, I mean, it's obvious to anyone who who studies things honestly. We are like the other animals. We're made of the same stuff. We have the same physical processes. Otherwise, uh, they couldn't um, uh, test new pharmaceuticals on other species of animals and to find out if they'll work in us. So, I mean, it's, it's obvious that we have biologically much in common with the other animals. However, we are not mere animals. We're not merely physical beings, and I would say the other animals are not either, but that's another discussion. Um, but we are unique among the other animals in that we correspond to God in our, in our very being. We correspond to God in our very being. We are made to live, to be like Him, to become more and more like Him, and to live in communion with Him eternally. And uh, we cannot say that uh, with any certainty about any other animal. So, um, yes, we are unique. How that uniqueness came about uh, is to me a bit of a mystery. It is described in the book of Genesis uh, using different, um, different uh, 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 images uh, or, or different uh, pictures of different stories. For example, um, in one place it says that God formed Adam Amin ha adama from the earth, Adam in ha adama, so that it emphasizes how Adam, the man, corresponds to ha adama, which means the soil, the earth. In the Hebrew, it's very clear that correspondence. Uh, it shows that we are made of the same stuff and experience the same physical processes as all the rest of creation. Um, but God creates us. Uh, with his hands. With the other things, he speaks, and it is. With us, he creates us, he forms us out of the ground. Mm. I think that's really significant. Mm -hmm. And the soul or the spirit? The soul and the spirit, that's described as coming into the first created man by God breathing into his nostrils the breath of life. Yeah. The soul is the spirit of God. That's the enlivening energy of God that, that enters into us. Yes. When we take breath. Our, first breath, our first breath and for every succeeding breath, Beautiful. That, uh, that breath of God, yeah, that 
that created and sustaining energy of God, which is itself uncreated. Which it's, is it comes another, from God. It it's keeps such us a, going. It's such an interesting fact that you're saying this because all uh, so many of the other, um, especially like Buddhism, is so adamant about one's ability to train their focus oh, on yes. the breath breathing yes. and that Paying is god every breathing. breath is god it's mm -hmm. a divine gift and yeah. yes every breath is a divine gift mm -hmm. yes. um and what would you say is the most beautiful thing in the world the most beautiful thing in the world undoubtedly undoubtedly it is in my view our Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man, and his holy bride, the church. That is the most beautiful thing in the world that I know of. Yes. Ooh, this has been such a good conversation, Father Sala. Thank it's you. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I'd love to, um, as before we close, I'd love to have you run, take us through a prayer. Sure. Um, I think a good prayer for us to offer at this point is a very simple prayer that Orthodox Christians say several times a day when we pause to pray. Uh, it's a prayer that is addressed to our Lord, the Holy Spirit, whom we have spoken of today. Uh, usually our prayers are addressed to God the Father or God the Son. It really doesn't matter to whom we address them because they are all one, <laughs> as we've said. But this prayer is addressed to our Lord, the Holy Spirit, and it goes like this. O heavenly King, Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who are in all places, filling all things, treasury of good things and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every stain and save our souls, O good one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Salva. This has been a big honor and pleasure for me to be able to bring you on the show and have you share who you are and the teachings of Orthodox Christianity and so many of the other aspects of your worldview. Thank you. It's been a great honor and pleasure for me too, my friend. Thank, Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. It was good to share this Thank time you. with you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We really appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. We would also love for you to have more conversations with your friends, your families, co-workers, people online on social media about Orthodox Christianity and about the Holy Trinity, about all of the things that we talked about today on the show, what the future of all of this is going to be like, and also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations, the spiritual leaders around the world that you believe in, support them and help them grow. You can find all of the links below as well, again, to the Transfiguration Greek Orthodox Church. You can find simulations links below our Patreon or PayPal or cryptocurrency link. You can design cool merch and get paid. All those links are below. Support the ones in your communities as well, everyone. And go and build the future, everyone. Commune with the divine and manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon.